tracks were screaming. Not the whistle, not the brakes, the tracks themselves. Metal grinding against metal, rails bending under impossible weight, and somewhere in the engineer's cab, instruments spiking into zones they were never meant to reach. This wasn't supposed to happen. The calculations were perfect. The design was flawless. But on April 27, 1953, in the middle of Wyoming's Red Desert, one of the largest steam locomotives ever built was about to teach the entire railroad industry a lesson nobody wanted to learn. This is the story of Union Pacific Big Boy Number 4005, the train that pushed steel and ambition to their absolute breaking point. Building the Giant Before we talk about what went wrong, you need to understand what made the Big Boy so massive in the first place. Back in the early 1940s, the Union Pacific Railroad had a serious problem. Their freight trains were getting heavier. The Rocky Mountains weren't getting any flatter, and they were wasting money by using two locomotives to haul what should have been one load. The solution? Build the biggest, most powerful steam locomotive anyone had ever seen. Enter Otto Jabelman, Union Pacific's head of mechanical engineering, who sat down with the American Locomotive Company and designed something that would make every other train look like a toy. Between 1941 and 1944, they built 25 of these steel giants. Each one measured over 132 feet long, longer than two city buses parked end to end. The weight? Over 1.2 million pounds. That's 600 tons of locomotive, not counting the tender full of coal and water behind it. To put that in perspective, imagine 120 elephants balanced on two thin ribbons of steel. Now imagine those elephants moving at 60 miles per hour. The engineering marvel. The big boy wasn't just heavy, it was smart engineering. Most locomotives of that era had all their wheels on one rigid frame, which meant they couldn't handle tight curves without tearing themselves apart. The big boy used something called articulation. Think of it like a hinge in the middle of the locomotive. The front set of eight driving wheels could pivot independently from the rear set, letting this massive machine navigate mountain curves that would stop other engines cold. This wasn't just convenient, it was essential for the Wasatch Range routes where grades hit 1.14%. That doesn't sound like much until you're pulling 3,600 tons of freight up a mountain. The boiler pressure hit 300 pounds per square inch, generating 6,290 horsepower. For comparison, a modern semi-truck has maybe 400 to 600 horsepower. The big boy's tractive effort, the raw pulling power, measured 135,375 pounds of force. That's enough to yank a fully loaded freight train from a dead stop on an uphill grade. The firebox alone was 150 square feet, burning through 11 tons of low-grade Wyoming coal every hour. The tender carried 28 tons of coal and 25,000 gallons of water, enough to run for hours without stopping. Crews loved them. Despite their size, big boys were surprisingly easy to handle. The Valschart's valve gear, the mechanism that controlled steam flow to the cylinders, operated smoothly. Engineers described the sound not as noise, but as a kind of mechanical music, a rhythmic chuffing that you could feel in your chest from a half a mile away. When a big boy passed through a small town, windows rattled, the ground shook and people stopped whatever they were doing to watch. By 1953, the big boys had been running for over a decade. They'd hauled millions of tons of freight across Wyoming and Utah. They'd proven themselves reliable, efficient, and safe. Number 4005 was no exception. It had been converted to burn oil instead of coal in 1946, then switched back to coal in 1948 when the oil burning setup caused heating problems. By April of 1953, it was a veteran locomotive with thousands of miles under its wheels. Nothing about that morning suggested anything could go wrong. The day everything changed. April 27th, dawn cloudy in the Red Desert. This stretch of Wyoming, just west of Wamsutter in Sweetwater County, is about as remote as America gets. Sagebrush, red dirt, and empty horizon in every direction. The nearest town was miles away. A light mist hung in the air, the kind that makes everything feel muffled and distant. Number 4005 was heading west with 62 freight cars and a caboose, hauling everything from tractors to typewriters to live hogs. Engineer Leo Murray sat at their controls. Fireman Lawrence Endress tended the fire. Head brakeman James Anderton rode in the cab with them. In the caboose, conductor James Walker and brakeman Ivan Shuragar watched the rails disappear behind them. 
Meanwhile, a section gang, the crew responsible for maintaining this stretch of track, was working near Red Desert. Their foreman was Kenneth Mayfield, a man with years of railroad experience. That morning, a sheep herder approached them. He needed help moving over a thousand sheep across the tracks, a common enough request in Wyoming ranch country. Mayfield contacted dispatch to coordinate, then made a decision that would haunt him for the rest of his life. He assigned a worker named Ralph Vicente to operate the switches that would open the siding, allowing the sheep to cross safely while displaying block signals to warn any approaching trains. Here's where things get complicated. Ralph Vicente had been on the job for exactly 80 minutes. He was a Puerto Rican immigrant with limited English proficiency. He'd never thrown a switch before, and Kenneth Mayfield, for reasons that were never satisfactorily explained, walked 300 yards away to talk to the sheep herder instead of supervising directly. Vicente stood by the east switch, waiting for a signal from Mayfield. Number 4005 was coming down a slight grade, traveling at about 50 miles per hour. The tracks were rated safe for speed, the weather was fine, the locomotive was running perfectly. The fatal mistake. Then Ralph Vicente threw the switch. Nobody knows exactly why. Maybe he misunderstood Mayfield's instructions. Maybe he panicked. Maybe he thought he saw a signal that wasn't there. What matters most is that he opened the switch just seconds before the big boy reached it. The moment he realized his mistake, he tried to throw it back, but 600 tons of steel traveling at 50 miles per hour doesn't stop for anyone. The locomotive hit the diverging track at full speed. The siding was designed for slow movements, maybe 10 or 15 miles per hour. The big boy slammed into it at 50. The rails couldn't handle the sudden lateral force. The front wheels jumped the track first, then the drivers. Number 4005 lurched sickeningly to the left, its massive weight grinding into the roadbed. The sound must have been unbelievable. Metal shrieking, rocks pulverizing, the whole locomotive tilting onto its side as it plowed through the desert. Catastrophic impact. The locomotive skidded on its left side, tearing up rails and ties like they were made of cardboard. The momentum carried it forward, gouging a trench in the earth. Then the tender hit. 28 tons of coal and 25,000 gallons of water in a steel container, all of it slamming into the back of a locomotive cab at highway speed. The cab crumpled like tinfoil. The impact was instant and catastrophic. Leo Murray and Lawrence Endress died immediately, crushed by the collapsing metal around them. James Anderton was trapped in an 18-inch high space, surrounded by twisted steel and live steam hissing from broken pipes. Behind the tender, 18 freight cars piled up in a chaotic heap. Couplers snapped, wheels buckled, entire cars folded in half. Cargo scattered across the desert, tractors, sewing machines, typewriters, all of it tumbling through the air and landing in the sagebrush. Some of the cars carried live hogs. The impact killed most of them instantly, but witnesses later reported seeing some pigs stagger out of the wreckage, apparently unharmed, and wander off into the desert. The surreal image of hogs trotting through scattered machinery while steam roared from the broken locomotive added a bizarre note to an already horrific scene. The pile of wreckage rose 70 feet high in places. Rails jutted from the ground at crazy angles. The roadbed, carefully graded and compressed over years of maintenance, was torn apart. Live steam continued shooting from the big boy's broken pipes for 25 minutes, creating a hot fog that made it almost impossible for rescuers to approach. The sound of hissing steam, groaning metal, and the occasional crash as wreckage settled created an atmosphere that witnesses compared to a battlefield. Ten hours of agony. James Anderton was still alive, barely. Trapped in that 18-inch space with steam scalding him and coal dust choking him, he endured ten hours while rescue crews cut through debris. They gave him morphine to dull the pain. He asked for water. He asked for a cigarette. And he gave testimony that would prove crucial to the investigation. He told them exactly what he'd seen. A single man throwing the switch just ahead of them. No time to react. No warning. On April 29th, two days after the wreck, James Anderton died from burns covering 80% of his body, shock, and internal injuries. He was the third and final fatality. In the caboose, James Walker and Ivan Shurgar felt the train suddenly lurch and then go slack as the couplers broke. They stopped safely, shaken but unhurt. Walker immediately called dispatch while Shurgar ran forward placing torpedoes on the rails to warn any approaching trains. What they found when they reached the front of the train defied description. 
The locomotive they'd been following, this mechanical marvel that had pulled them across Wyoming without effort, was now a mangled wreck lying on its side with its cab completely destroyed. The aftermath. The wreckage blocked the main line completely. Every train heading west was stopped. Union Pacific had to build a temporary bypass, which they called a shoe fly, routing trains around the disaster site. This took nine hours. Meanwhile, westbound traffic was rerouted through Cheyenne, adding hundreds of miles to their journeys. The economic impact rippled through the entire rail network. Delayed shipments, missed connections, customers demanding explanations. In the middle of the Red Desert, crews worked around the clock to clear the debris and figure out what had gone wrong. The investigation. Investigators descended on the site within hours. Union Pacific sent their own teams. The Interstate Commerce Commission launched a formal inquiry. The Sweetwater County Coroner's Jury was impaneled to determine cause of death and assign blame. What they found was a perfect storm of bad decisions and worse luck. Kenneth Mayfield had assigned a completely inexperienced worker to a critical safety risk. Ralph Vicente, through some combination of confusion and panic, had thrown the switch at exactly the wrong moment. And the big boy, designed to haul massive loads safely at high speeds, had been diverted onto a siding never meant to handle such forces. The physics of destruction. The physics of what happened are straightforward. When you stand on a diving board, your weight presses down with a certain force. When you jump on that diving board, the force multiplies because momentum adds to mass. Now imagine that diving board is a mile of railroad track and the jumper weighs 1.2 million pounds. The big boy wasn't just heavy, it was moving. The kinetic energy, the energy of motion, turned that weight into a battering ram. When it hit the siding at 50 miles per hour, the rails had no chance. They bent, buckled, and broke. A railroad track isn't just two rails, it's a system. Rails sit on wooden ties. Ties rest on a ballast, crushed rock that spreads the weight. Below that, compressed earth forms the roadbed. Each layer matters. Each layer is engineered to handle specific loads. The main line where number 4005 was traveling could handle 50 miles per hour because all those layers were built to distribute the force. The siding, designed for slow switching movements, had less robust ballast and a less compacted roadbed. When 600 tons hit at its speed, the entire system collapsed. Rails bent sideways, ties splintered, ballast scattered, the roadbed, compressed over years, was torn apart in seconds. The investigation also revealed communication failures. Kenneth Mayfield later claimed he'd given clear instructions to wait for his signal. Ralph Pacenti claimed Mayfield had told him to throw the switch and then walked away. The language barrier made it difficult to determine exactly what had been said. What was clear was that a man with 80 minutes of railroad experience had been put in charge of a critical safety operation without proper supervision. The coroner's jury faulted both men. Mayfield for negligent supervision, Vicente for improper switch operation. No criminal charges were filed, but the incident prompted immediate changes in Union Pacific's training and safety protocols. Rebuilding the ghost. The locomotive itself told its own story. When crews finally dragged number 4005 back to Rollins Yard, witnesses described it as a ghost. The frame was bent, drive rods were missing, the cab was gone completely, torn away by the impact with the tender, the boiler miraculously was intact. No explosion, no catastrophic failure of the pressure vessel. Even in destruction, the big boy showed its robust engineering. Union Pacific decided to rebuild it. The work took months, possibly involving a replacement tender from another locomotive. When it was finished, number 4005 looked nearly as good as new, but it never returned to service. By 1953, diesel locomotives were already replacing steam. The economics didn't make sense anymore. Track damage was extensive but repairable. Crews replaced hundreds of feet of torn rail. They reballasted the roadbed. They reinforced the structure. Within weeks, trains were running through Red Desert again, though probably a bit more cautiously. The sheep that caused the whole incident presumably got across the tracks eventually, though historical records are silent on their fate. Lessons written in steel. What changed after 1953? Railroad safety protocols got stricter. Training requirements increased. The idea of putting an inexperienced worker in charge of switches became unthinkable. Communication systems improved. The accident at Red Desert, while tragic, pushed the industry to examine its procedures and close gaps that nobody'd noticed before. Sometimes the greatest engineering achievements aren't the things we build, they're the disasters we prevent through lessons learned the hard way. The big boy class continued operating through the 1950s, 
hauling freight across Wyoming and Utah until the early 1960s when the last ones were retired. No other big boy was ever involved in a fatal accident. No other incident came close to the destruction at Red Desert. The class proved remarkably safe given their size and power. The number 4005's wreck remained a reminder that size and power mean nothing without proper human oversight. Where they stand today. Today, eight big boys survive. Number 4005 sits in the Forney Museum of Transportation in Denver, Colorado. If you visit, you can walk around it, study the massive drivers, peer into the firebox. The rebuild was so thorough that you'd never know it was once twisted wreckage in the Wyoming desert. Every year since 2003, the museum holds Big Boy Day, a memorial for Leo Murray, Lawrence Andrus, and James Anderton. Visitors can hear their story, understand their sacrifice, and remember that behind every engineering marvel are human beings taking risks. Number 4014, restored by Union Pacific in 2019, still runs excursion trains. It was converted to burn oil instead of coal for cleaner operation and modern regulations. When it thunders through small towns pulling passenger cars for rail enthusiasts, the ground still shakes, windows still rattle, people still stop to watch. The magic of the big boy hasn't faded, even in an age of electric trains and magnetic levitation. There's something primal about that much power, that much mass, moving with such purpose. The human factor. The 1953 derailment at Red Desert teaches us something fundamental about engineering. You can design the perfect machine. You can calculate every stress, test every component, build with the finest materials. But machines don't operate themselves. Humans run them, maintain them, make decisions about them. And humans make mistakes. Ralph Vicente threw a switch too early. Kenneth Mayfield failed to supervise properly. Leo Murray, Lawrence Endress and James Anderton paid the price for decisions they never made. The difference between engineering triumph and disaster often measures in inches. The rails deflected too far. The locomotive hit the curve too fast. The timing was off by seconds. Change any one variable and number 4005 rolls through Red Desert safely. Just another freight run on just another day. That's not what happened. What happened became part of railroad history. A cautionary tale about the balance between ambition and reality between what steel can do and what physics allows. Every train that crosses America today does so with protocols written in the wreckage of incidents like this one. Switch procedures, training requirements, communication standards, all of them refined by accidents that taught us what not to do. The tracks don't scream anymore, not like they did that cloudy morning in 1953. They're stronger now, better maintained, monitored by systems that would have prevented Ralph Vicente's mistake. But the lesson remains, when you push engineering to its limits, when you build machines that dwarf everything around them, you better make sure the humans operating them are up to the task. The big boy represented the peak of steam locomotive development, the furthest the technology could be pushed before diesel made it obsolete. In a way, number 4005's derailment marked the end of an era. Not because it destroyed the locomotive, they rebuilt it. Not because it destroyed confidence in the design, the other big boys kept running safely for years. It marked the end because it showed that even the mightiest machine was only as reliable as the weakest human link in the chain. In 1953, that link broke at Red Desert, Wyoming, taking three lives and teaching a lesson the railroad industry would never forget.